All right, so the economy is in a bit of a slump, and banks aren't doing very well. Wrong investments, bankruptcy, inflation. Let's just say it sucks. But we do need them for our money. Or do we? Boom. Introducing bitcoins. Bitcoin is a decentralized digital currency, which simply means no banks, no governments, no borders. Bitcoin and the Bitcoin network just consists of people using Bitcoin. Awesome, right? This is how it works. Make a digital Bitcoin wallet with special wallet software or mobile apps and get some coins. You can do this in two ways. Either buy them on an exchange site or accept them as a payment, of course. Now the cool stuff. Because there is no bank, transactions go directly from person to person and fees are very low. And because everything goes via the internet, transactions are checked, verified and finished within minutes. Nice. But best of all, no inflation. There is a limited amount of bitcoins in the world and that will never change. The market determines the value, but for the past few months, one bitcoin has been worth more than a hundred bucks. Although it's very new, you can buy stuff with them on more and more websites every day. So let's begin. Andreas Antonopoulos, welcome to the show. How are you? Uh, thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm doing great. Thank you. Well, no, How are that, you today? I'm very well. I'm just uh, shocked I actually got in contact with you. This is the first time I actually reached out to someone on Twitter and I thought, this guy's never going to get back to me. And uh, lo and behold, within 10 minutes, I was uh, corresponding with uh, Andreas Antonopoulos, the Buddha of, uh, of Bitcoin, the Bitcoin <laughs> Buddha. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's uh, thank you so much for coming on the show, Andreas. Uh, the reason I want to talk to you, obviously, as I said before, is uh, I hear so much about Bitcoin. Uh, and I'm also at the same time fascinated, I think many people are, but also confused. Mm -hmm. uh, so please bear with me. Luckily, I guess it's probably best we're doing this over Skype, so you can't put two fists and feet across the table and strangle me for stupidity as I ask you such, uh, I guess, layman term questions. But I'm trying to ask, not from my point of view also, but from also... Uh, my listeners or readers or watchers, if you will, to try to walk through, if we can, quickly to unpack this as to what Bitcoin is, how it yeah. works, because essentially it's a, is it kind of a social network of money or a bit torrenting of money and how it fits well, into think... the world, the structure of the world and these uh, long entrenched banking systems we've had for thousands of years, which began, I guess, with uh, sticks and then coins and then whatever we agree on what is a value as a currency. What is Bitcoin, Andreas? Bitcoin is a protocol, um, and I think uh, that really doesn't explain things for most people, um, but that's exactly what it is. It's a protocol for money, and what that means is that um, it's not owned by any specific company or um, organization, but it runs as a means for computers to communicate with each other independently in a flat uh, non-hierarchical network. Um, now, there's another protocol most of your viewers are probably familiar with that they've been using that allows computers to communicate in a flat non-hierarchical network, and that's the internet. Yeah. And so, the one of the best ways I find to describe Bitcoin is as the internet of money. At first glance, when you look at Bitcoin, it appears to be money for the internet, and it very much is that. Um, but that's only a tip of the iceberg. Uh, really... Bitcoin is the internet of money. It is a network platform. Uh, it is a protocol that allows you to uh, communicate ownership and value uh, between uh, computers that have no prior relationship or any requirement to trust each other. Yes. Um, and without appeal to any central authority or third party, um, other than the network as a whole. And so uh, that's where uh, you know many of the other similarities with the internet appear. Uh, the fact that uh, on the internet uh, all computers are treated equally. You're just an IP address. It doesn't matter if you're uh, the IP address of the New York Times or the IP address of an Egyptian blogger tweeting from the the front lines of uh, a revolution in Cairo or whatever that may be. Sure. And uh, Bitcoin does that for money, uh, but not just for money. Uh, it does it generally for anything uh, with which you can claim ownership. So you can, you could take the same technology. In fact, many companies are doing just that, 
and use the Bitcoin network uh, or other similar networks to transmit value and ownership of stocks, bonds, uh, loans, uh, various types of assets. Uh, you know, you could register uh, a car, you could register a bicycle, uh, and, and then transfer that as a digital asset from one person to another just as easily as you send an email. Sure. Well, I presume that will be, I guess, useful in a country where the, I guess, banking is either corrupt or non-existent. Correct? In like a, in a third world setting. I mean, I, I first heard of this. I guess if we, if I think back now, is I, I guess the Silk Road scandal when they were like, oh, people are paying for stuff with Bitcoin. They use it. I mean, Starcraft, the video game, uses it. I think uh, Warcraft, of course, which you can, I guess, turn Bitcoins into cash if you do well in your quest. But also Silk Road, which for those that don't know, is a kind of. Uh, off the books dark web uh, website where you could buy uh, guns drugs what have you that's how i first learned of bitcoin so i was like oh what's this like crazy thing but i mean yeah, uh, well, you could buy lots of things on it so has been shut down um and uh as soon as it was 20 replacements popped up in its place um you could buy all kinds of things it was basically an, an open anonymous free market sure uh, some people used it to buy asthma inhalers to avoid the the hundred dollars in in a doctor's visit and and hundred and fifty dollars for a prescription, big farm uh, profits. You know, in in our failed healthcare system. Yes. Um. You know, it addresses basically failed institutional systems. That's what you do when you take um, something that used to be uh, institution based, uh, and then you transform it into something that is platform based, and then you go one step further and you transform it into something that is protocol based. Right. What that does is that it opens it up to a uh, global network. It turns uh, that thing into a globalized system, and it puts everyone on an equal footing. So right. then the question is, do we need to do that with money? And you mentioned. Obviously, one use case is where the banks are non-existent. Um, the other use case is where the banks or the governments are corrupt. Uh, arguably, a lot of people who are involved in Bitcoin uh, believe that those two cases cover all of the world. Well, of course, uh, I was going to say Western... You don't have banks or you have corrupt banks and institutions. And um, if you believe my uh, Greek ancestors, uh, power corrupts and money is the absolute power that corrupts absolutely. So... If banks exist, then they become corrupt pretty quickly, and so do the institutions that control money in general. The problem here is that if you give control of money, and if you trust uh, one party over another, pretty soon they're going to start using that control of money to enrich themselves and to accumulate power. Uh, so um, money tends to corrupt the institutions as touches. Bitcoin is uh, an interesting solution to that problem. It simply says, let's do it without institutions. Let's do it without giving anyone control. And then there's no one to corrupt. The system works by mathematical rules. Everyone's on an equal footing. You don't need to rely on trusting any third party uh, or even trusting the other parties you're doing transactions with because the network resolves um, the ambiguities through mathematics in a very predictable pattern. And, and what that does is very similar to what happens when you introduce um, you know, the internet to news or entertainment. It, it makes everything much more egalitarian. Sure. It removes centers of power and corruption, um, and it allows for the unfettered uh, global dissemination um, of, of value in this case, in the case of, of Bitcoin. It, it turns uh, banking into an application that you run on your phone. Um, and that is immediately completely global, unforgeable, uh, and secure. So, what? Just to go right back to the start, what exactly is a Bitcoin? How is it made? And yeah, what is a Bitcoin? <laughs> well, so the word Bitcoin uh, refers to um, the currency and the network and the the technology behind it, which can be quite confusing because the same name for all three things. Mm. Uh, Bitcoin is simply a unit of currency, and, and that is something that, uh, that runs on top of the network, but also fuels the network itself. Uh, as a unit of currency, uh, if you're familiar with other currencies, then it's not really that strange a concept. If you have pounds sterling, uh, dollars, yen, 
um, and uh, possibly very soon drachma, uh, then you can also have Bitcoin. It's a currency, and it's exchangeable for other currencies in exactly the same way that all currencies are exchangeable for each other. Um, there's an exchange rate, and that exchange rate is determined by uh, market fluctuations. So Bitcoin goes up and goes down vis-a-vis -vis other currencies, just as they go up and down vis-a-vis -vis each other. Sure. Uh, it's a currency that exists uh, on a network basis. And the major difference of Bitcoin as a currency is that it is not issued by a government. Um, it does not require permission from any government. And it is, uh, from inception, entirely global. If anything, you can think of it as the currency of the internet. If the internet were a, a, a global power, and many of us argue that it is, uh, then now it has a currency, and that currency is Bitcoin. Bitcoin is the natural currency of the internet. As we live in, a, I guess, a debt-based society, for every, I guess, dollar or pound that's made, it incurs a, a, a unit of debt. Uh, Bitcoin doesn't have that attachment of debt. Is that correct? That is correct. Uh, yeah. Bitcoin is an asset-based currency, not a debt-based currency. Sure. Um, in order to create Bitcoin, the network has to marshal computing power. And that computing power is marshaled through a competitive process that occurs every 10 minutes. And this competitive process involves lots of computers uh, essentially proving a mathematical algorithm which allows them to validate and secure the network. Now, by proving this mathematical algorithm, they have to invest uh, in electricity. It, it consumes electricity to prove this algorithm because it requires an enormous amount of computation. And by investing in electricity and gaining reward in Bitcoin, it creates this dynamic balance where if you play by the rules and you participate in this competition and you play fairly, uh, if you follow the rules and everybody else can validate that you follow the rules, you have sure. a chance of uh, solving the problem and, and getting a reward in the next 10 minute round. If you try to cheat, um, what happens is you end up spending the money on the electricity, but uh, you don't get a valid solution because the rest of the network sees that you're so, uh, cheating and they reject it. And that, that dynamic tension between the possibility of the reward, but the fact that you have to spend money to participate, uh, makes it more profitable to play by the rules rather than cheat, and provides the security for the entire network, meaning that um, the network as a whole, with no one in charge, uh, gets to resolve the rules of Bitcoin every 10 minutes. Has it come from a centralized place? This uh, It's called Bitcoin mining, is that correct? This is actually creating the Bitcoin values. Is that is that? Am I right in thinking that? Has it come so from a... this, um, I think there's this misunderstanding. Uh, I don't like the terminology very much, but let me explain it a different way. Sure. It, Bitcoin mining is the process that secures the network. It basically validates every transaction that happens on the network and validates it against these common rules called consensus. Um, now, mining, the purpose of mining is not to create new Bitcoin. Um, that's the reward. So the creation of new Bitcoin is to reward mining in such a way that it creates this dynamic tension between um, taking a risk by spending money on electricity and gaining reward if you play by the rules. And that dynamic tension ensures that no one cheats. Um, but the creation of new Bitcoin is a side effect. The, the purpose of mining is to provide security for the network. And the idea here is that rather than having one party provide security, like Visa provides security for the Visa network, PayPal provides security for the PayPal platform, sure. uh, rather than having one party validating the transactions and providing security, um, you have this global competition where you never know who's going to validate them next, but they can only validate them if everybody else agrees too. And, and that means that there is no um, vesting of power or control in any one party. So there's no governing body that approves uh, this Bitcoin. It's, uh, is it like file sharing in a sense, where you've got multiple tiny little bits of information crossing between uh, computer yes. networks? It's, it's very much like BitTorrent in that your files are not stored on any one server, but they're composed of multiple interactions. Um, the creation of new Bitcoin and the securing of the network is an emergent property caused by this competition and dynamic tension between those participating in mining. Um, and that power is distributed among uh, thousands of participants at any point in time who have invested in both hardware and electricity. Uh, and that means that um, there is no concentration of power in Bitcoin. There's no central validation. The network as a whole 
validates um, transactions, just like in BitTorrents, the network as a whole stores files. No one uh, specifically is providing you with a file. But I suppose with bit, uh, with BitTorrenting, everyone has access to those files if they're sending, seeding, and leaching files back or forth. Does mm -hmm. that mean someone on the network can go into your Bitcoin wallet and steal from you? No, so the Bitcoin wallet is a completely different structure that then uses the network validation rules to give you control over specific funds. Sure. So a Bitcoin wallet is basically uh, a collection of uh, digital keys that you use to create digital signatures that allow you to write Bitcoin transactions, essentially to write checks sure. that can be redeemed on the Bitcoin network. So um, if I have Bitcoin... It's not that I have Bitcoin in my wallet. Um, the Bitcoin's actually on the network recorded um, on the distributed ledger. In my wallet, what I have is the keys that allow me to control that Bitcoin and to write checks against it. So when I create a transaction that says, pay Ethan one Bitcoin, um, I use a digital key to sign that transaction. Sure. I broadcast that transaction to the network. And then everyone on the network validates and propagates that transaction. And if it's mined into a block, then everyone validates that block. And so I can't forge that signature because everyone is going to check it against the known keys that I, that, that I control. Um, and once everybody's validated that transaction, then effectively you now control that Bitcoin and can write a check on that Bitcoin and, and pay someone else. And the network will accept that you control the Bitcoin because they saw the transaction that gave it to you. Right. Um, so essentially, the Bitcoin network exists to validate these transactions. And then these transactions can, uh, at the most basic level, involve payments. I send you a Bitcoin. But they could also be... Um, a transaction that uses um, a Bitcoin to express something else. So, for example, I could register my bicycle and then I could transfer ownership of a bicycle or a car or a house uh, to you. And, and in that case, the transaction is encoding the transfer of, of the title, if you like, to the bicycle. Um, and you make a transaction paying me in Bitcoin and effectively I've transferred ownership of that asset. And there's all kinds of things you can build. Once you have this capability... You, know, you have essentially a programmable money, uh, a network-based or protocol-based money system that can be validated independently by anyone, that doesn't require trusting in any single party, uh, and that is completely global. Well, if you've got that kind of platform, um, you can come up with thousands of ideas of how to apply it in all kinds of situations that involve commerce, uh, either between individuals or between corporations or even between software agents. Um, and it, it, that, that's why people get really excited about Bitcoin, because now you have this independent way of validating transactions on a global basis that no one can censor, no one can control, no one can seize. Um, and, and, and that is truly a powerful technology. No, it most certainly is. But I think, uh, doesn't it upset the apple cart of the old order, so to speak? I mean, whenever we've had a, let's use a president as an example, uh, JFK or maybe uh, Abraham Lincoln who've tried to put the power of money back into the hands of the people and get them off a debt-based society. They all seem to meet with an unfortunate end or they get uh, maybe disgraced or taken out of the picture. Is there a kind of pushback from uh, uh, the banking system, the old guard, if you will, versus this new uh, technology? Because there are multiple other like uh, digital currencies, I guess, right? There's, uh, well, digital currency started in the 70s with the invention of public key cryptography. And uh, pretty much what you were saying happened to many of the previous digital currencies that, uh, you know, if they look like they were getting successful, they'd get squashed. Sure. In so order to squash something, you have to have something to stomp on. And uh, the magic of Bitcoin is there is no center. There is no control area. There is no something that you can stomp on to make Bitcoin stop. Um, you have to stop everyone who's on Bitcoin. Just like it's very diff it was very easy to shut down Napster, but very, very difficult to stop BitTorrent because sure. BitTorrent doesn't exist anywhere centrally. And as long as two people are using BitTorrent, BitTorrent continues to exist. Well, same thing applies to Bitcoin. It was very easy to, to stomp on mm -hmm. eGold and um, you know, many of the predecessors of digital currencies, but Bitcoin used um, the knowledge gained from other technologies, including BitTorrent, sure. to design a system that is completely decentralized. And so, how do you do? That? How do you stop that? Well, so a powerful uh, it's, entity. It's, it's, uh, sorry to interrupt. A powerful entity couldn't kind of essentially, uh, let me say, 
they create a, a, a website like Silk Road or an arms dealing website that's off the books. And then they frame kind of Bitcoin, if you will. Thousands of millions of dollars have been going through in or Bitcoins in transaction buying. Even if it's a setup, maybe the CIA does it. Let's go into fantasy land here. Could they not disgrace the image? Fantasy land. The entire no? Silk Road operation um, involved the two corrupt DE agents uh, who... Uh, not only were stealing from Silk Road and blackmailing various participants, but even were the ones who tried to set up um, h hired uh, hits uh, against some of the... So, you know, you don't need to go into fantasy land to, to find that. There was a corrupt government agent behind the Silk Road. So uh, the question is, you know, what is achieved by, by setting up these types of false operations? Um if, if you think Bitcoin survives because no one trying to attack it, you're missing the point. Bitcoin mm. survives despite the fact that everyone is attacking it all the time. And all it does is it gets stronger. Uh, this is a characteristic of systems um, that are called anti-fragile. Systems that have a tendency to dynamically adapt to external stimulus, disruptive stimulus. And in doing so... Uh, become stronger. Our immune system works that way. The internet works that way. There used to be a time when a single denial of service attack could take down Google. Sure. Uh, that doesn't happen anymore, and that's not because denial of service attacks stopped. It's because the entire set of uh, architectures involved in the internet became more and more and more resilient over time. And the same exact thing has happened to Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin is getting more resilient over time from a technical perspective because as it thwarts each attack, uh, it gets stronger. Sure. And so absolutely, lots and lots of parties are trying to attack Bitcoin. Hackers are trying to break um, individual wallets as well as the system as a whole to steal Bitcoin. They've been unsuccessful in attacking the system um, but they are sometimes successful in attacking individuals, sure. as well as uh, centralized exchanges and things like that. And all that does is it pushes the system to become more decentralized, uh, more resilient, more robust. But the music industry uh, obviously pushes the conundrum. Yeah, you, you can't you can't stop something that is amorphous. It's like trying to fight water. Yeah. Uh, and it's it's a very zen like uh, attitude if you like well it freezes in the rock and then splits it apart i guess you you could right. say that right but yeah the music industry Absolutely. pushed back against uh, torrenting and stuff and that obviously did damage uh, the big corporations the big music corporations will that not the same thing happen to banks eventually and then we're in a we'll be in some sort of like financial mess as we i, I guess the banks try and survive against bitcoin if it as it gains more step the, the, I, I don't think Bitcoin needs to attack the banks for the banks to, to be in a financial mess. The banks are in a financial mess themselves because they are extremely fragile. They're the exact opposite. They're hierarchical, top-heavy, expensive organizations that use 1970s technology in the 24th century. Um, they, they try to persuade you that you have to pay uh, you know, $5 a month for the privilege of them holding your money for three to five business days, whatever the hell a business day is, um, and, <laughs> and delay your funds. And in, in the age of the internet, it takes weeks to make an international payment. And only if the co country you're trying to send or receive money to is not involved in some kind of geopolitical fight with with some other country. Um, and, and all of these uh, structured and layered systems where every intermediary takes a cut, collects your personal information, then loses it, exposing you to identity theft. Um, it, it's expensive, it's broken, it's cumbersome, it's slow, it's ineffective, it's inefficient. There has never been an industry more ripe for disruption than the financial industry. Oh, absolutely. And for the most part, they've avoided competition effectively by having veto power over new, in, new entrants. Uh, they can simply say no if you try to do something interesting or competitive because they deny you access to the financial infrastructure. And Bitcoin simply bypasses that and says, look, we've built a global financial infrastructure that doesn't need the banks. And you can't say no to that. Um, you can try and fight it on a local basis, but well, I'm sure lots of royal it, it families and governments would have uh, would take uh, issue with that, obviously. And as I guess they lose step. Sorry to interrupt you, Andreas, but as they lose kind of step and ground, wouldn't they just create some special interest group in some forthcoming elections to try and squish this kind of uh, electronic currency as they lose grip, or would they just be oh, absorbed they, into it? They they could certainly try, but uh, unfortunately. Um, you know, this is this is now to lobby you out of existence, in, in, essentially. 
it's a world in which we've got an entire generation of people who've grown up on the internet and have been thoroughly betrayed by societal institutions, by centralized societal institutions, one after the other, including the banks most recently in 2008, but probably again this week, uh, as we're seeing a massive meltdown. Um, you know, th that's the internet generation. They, they don't trust centralized institutions for good reason, because centralized institutions don't scale and can't be trusted. Sure. Um, but they do trust decentralized uh, systems, platforms, protocols like the internet. And uh, Bitcoin has a unique advantage because it is outside of these uh, local nativist uh, concerns and geopolitical games and all of that. It presents a neutral mathematical safe haven. Mm -hmm. And so even if um, you see some countries that try to ban it, and of course they will, just as some countries try to ban uh, the internet, all that tells you, it tells you more about how free those countries are. Sure. Uh, if a country is afraid of its own citizens having direct control over their money, the problem isn't the money or Bitcoin. The problem is that that government doesn't really believe in the basic principles of the Enlightenment in self-determination, freedom of association, freedom of speech and commerce. Um, and there are plenty of governments, certainly, that do not believe in those things and will try to stomp on these. And in those countries, the rule of law is already weak. Uh, and so when those governments try to ban something, they're more likely to generate more interest in it. But you've got to consider this in a broader context. And the broader context is that there are two and a half billion people who are completely unbanked with um, cash-based uh, societies or barter-based societies alone. There's more than four and a half billion people who are significantly underbanked with very limited access to banking facilities, if at all. And, and there are more than six and a half billion people who have no access to the type of power banking that we enjoy in the developed world, um, access to international credit, international finance, international markets. Or don't enjoy it. <laughs> that is a rare occasion. So, so then the question is, um, do you build money for the one billion or do you build money for the other six billion? Um, and to me, Bitcoin is money for the other six billion. And if you think they're going to be stopped from building a future for their children, from connecting to a world economy, just because some politician created a special interest group, when they have been massively underserved, um, you're going to be surprised because what this does is the same thing that cell phones did uh, in the developing world by completely bypassing antiquated technology and bringing online billions of people in just a couple of short decades. Uh, now, each one of those cell phones is a banking terminal. Uh, and that can create a real revolution in economic affairs around the world. It, it creates economic inclusion and economic empowerment on a scale that's completely unparalleled and unprecedented. Sure. Uh, if you think that can be stopped just by some fear-mongering, um, the, the point here is that people have basic needs that need to be met, and Bitcoin solves real problems for real people, sure. and, and that makes it very hard to stop. Here's another important thing to not notice. Over the last uh, decade, we've actually, or two decades almost, uh, the technology available for increasing economic inclusion and opportunity in the world has progressed enormously. Sure. And uh, how has banking and economic inclusion progressed, it's actually regressed. Um, what we're seeing now is a, a, a global um, almost movement to reduce the use of cash, to funnel all money through centrally controlled payment systems where uh, complete and total surveillance can be applied on every payment and transaction you make, to pass more money through intermediaries, and to cut off complete layers. Uh, whole countries, because of geopolitical battles, their entire populations held hostage by hyperinflation, by being cut off from international banking services. Most recently, we saw that in Greece. It's not a new phenomenon, but it's accelerating. Sure. Uh, and what we're seeing is a move towards an, a, a world in which there's less economic inclusion and opportunity um, because money, when it's uh, subject to totalitarian surveillance and control through these payment channels, when you eradicate cash, uh, you create environments where moralistic crusaders can say that they don't like what you're doing and can therefore ban you, like they banned WikiLeaks or they ban um, you know, sex-related websites with absolutely no judicial control, simply... Um, by fear-mongering with Visa and MasterCard, that's a very effective... I don't want to live in that world. Are you not concerned and, you'll be like the one of the Julian Assanges of uh, this new cryptocurrency, though? 
that you'll be framed for something as a, as a, as a way of maybe disgracing that and you'll become an, like under house arrest maybe because they've accused you of something you absolutely haven't done. But powerful entities, entities, of course, even though Bitcoin cannot be stopped in your words, they can still throw enough spanners in the works and I guess scare and worry people. So it just makes the progress all the more slow. Well, I mean, the, there, there's always that concern, but of course, you got to realize that WikiLeaks was a centralized organization and, mm. and was much easier uh, to target because by targeting one individual, you could essentially slow the flow of information to WikiLeaks. And even that, if you look at it on a broader scale, was ineffective, you could say. Um, it, it inconvenienced Julian Assange, but it didn't stop the flow of information. If anything, it promoted more decentralized solutions and a greater run of uh, whistleblowers and, and truth-tellers. In fact, WikiLeaks was one of the first uh, organizations to take advantage of Bitcoin um, when Visa, MasterCard, and American Express were shot out from funding uh, WikiLeaks without uh, any judicial process. Uh, simply through threats from the Department of Justice, the sure. kind of extrajudicial, heavy-handed bullying uh, that any country that has respect for the rule of law should be appalled by. Um, you know, they turn to Bitcoin, and, and more than 80% of their funding, I think, still happens exclusively in Bitcoin. Um, you know, the, the, the advantage of Bitcoin is that um, I have no control over Bitcoin. I have no special place in Bitcoin. I, ju I just enjoy talking about it and, and explaining it in simple terms to people. Uh, taking me out really doesn't accomplish anything other sure. than drawing attention to heavy-handed tactics and, and overreach. And I, I, I'm fairly confident that uh, I can continue to exercise free speech, uh, at least in the United States for a while, uh, without being threatened in that way. Uh, sure. but, but you're right. I mean, what does that tell you? If we have to fear simply talking about... Uh, technology, all of that reveals is really the breakdown of legitimacy of institutions and the rule of law, because uh, th that should not be acceptable in a, in a civilized society. Absolutely. No, it's, uh, it's just something I would worry about for some for someone like you. You obviously corrected me on that. Uh, I just find it an utterly fascinating subject. I'm sure, well, you obviously do, because you're like this uh, unofficial or official spokesman for Bitcoin. Oh, I'm entirely unofficial. That's the beauty of Bitcoin. There is no official anything. So who, in, who invented it, Andreas? Who, is there an organization or a person that invented Bitcoin? Or how does it work? Is it just some wacky computer programmer in the bowels of Nintendo factory in uh, Japan or something? Like, Quite possibly. Um, <laughs> this is one of the great stories um, of Bitcoin's uh, genesis. Uh, and I uh, compare it to the story of uh, Prometheus. Uh, Prometheus was the demigod who uh, captured fire from the gods and gave it to mankind, even though uh, they were banned from having fire. And once he gave fire to man, the gods couldn't take it back. They punished Prometheus very severely uh, through eternal torment. That's the mythology of Greece, and it's really a story about uh, speaking truth to power and disrupting the status quo. Um, the gods Bitcoin... did punish Prometheus, though quite badly for all eternity <laughs> sorry i said the gods did uh, punish prometheus obviously for all eternity right right so so um uh, bitcoin's uh, genesis story is is very interesting it came out of uh, a community called the cypherpunks uh which is basically a, a community of uh mathematicians and cryptographers who are interested in anonymity and freedom of speech and freedom of expression and it it, it became a social movement in the 70s and, and out of that came many of the uh, incredible advancements in cryptography and um, individual empowerment uh, through mathematics that, that, that we've seen have an enormous influence on the internet um, that allow people to have encryption and protection of their phones and computers. Sure. Um, out of that, uh, there, there was a mailing list uh, where many cypherpunks were talking for decades about digital currencies and in many many digital currencies launched there and one of these um a person going by the pseudonym satoshi nakamoto uh published a paper um at the same time they had already implemented a basic version of bitcoin this was based on mashing together a number of inventions by others in a, in a very unique way that uh, turned out to be very effective at creating decentralized currency uh, Satoshi Nakamoto published this paper, uh, created the software, and then collaborated with open source uh, community to continue shepherding the software and developing it. Um, there's nothing special about the software that uh, Satoshi Nakamoto controls. 
Um, it's, it's simply mathematics and open source software. Anyone can see exactly how it works. In fact, a, a programmer who reads the, the paper or reads the source code can re-implement Bitcoin or something very much like it in a weekend at home. Um, probably not very smoothly, but they can. Uh, and in fact, we've seen thousands of others copy that invention and create their own systems. Of course. Um, in mm. 2010, two years after launching that paper and the code, uh, Satoshi Nakamoto uh, decided to withdraw from public uh, from the public eye. Now, is this and, an individual or a group or a man or a woman? We don't know, right? Well, uh, and he disappeared. She disappeared. They disappeared. We have no idea. Um, there is currently no uh, evidence as to who Satoshi Nakamoto is. Um, we we don't know if uh, uh, if she's a physicist, a scientist, a group of scientists. Um, Satoshi mm -hmm. Nakamoto learned from Prometheus story and figured out that uh, having stolen control over money from the gods and given it to man, you better get out of Dodge <laughs> before they got him or her. Is the name, uh, do you think, an anagram or some mathematical puzzle in itself that might reveal the identity of the person or persons who invented it? I mean, there's a lot of speculation, a lot of conspiracy theories, and a lot of people interested in looking in the it's history. It's not you, is it? <laughs> you know, it's important to separate the idea from the person. Um, and it's important because if you look at the invention itself, it's an invention that's expressed in mathematics, and there is no special role of any one controlling entity. Sure. Um, so, you know, you, you might ask, do we need to know who Satoshi Nakamoto is to use Bitcoin, or should we fear the identity of Satoshi Nakamoto? And, and I would counter that um, uh, you and I and uh, millions of people and thousands of corporations uh, use Euclidean geometry uh, on a relatively daily basis, uh, yet we really don't know who Euclid was, or whether Euclid was one person or several scientists are writing under a single name, all of that's lost in the midst of history. And it doesn't matter because Euclidean geometry works regardless of who Euclid was, whether Euclid was a nice person or whether Euclid was a scumbag, uh, doesn't matter. And the same thing applies to Toshi Nakamoto. This is math. Um, and, th and that's the beauty of the system. Bitcoin represents... Um, putting your trust in, in well-known and well-understood mathematical concepts instead of any institution, organization, or individual. Uh, that is the core and revolutionary concept behind Bitcoin. Sure. Uh, and it has very, very deep-reaching uh, impact in our world. So are you, do, you, do you get paid in Bitcoin now for what you do when you go and do speaking tours and things, I guess, or in your yeah, daily I life? I've the majority of my income in Bitcoin for more than three years now. Wow. And so to anyone who tells me that Bitcoin isn't uh, money, uh, my own life is a counterfactual to that statement. Uh, and I live it every single day. Um, I obviously have to convert uh, significant proportions of my Bitcoin into uh, dollars and other currencies to pay bills where people don't yet accept Bitcoin. But I'm also able to buy plane tickets and hotel reservations and electronics and many, many, many other things. Can Bitcoin you name any, uh, sorry, any traders or organizations apart from what you've just mentioned that accept Bitcoin? I guess casinos, online casinos accept Bitcoin, right? Because I guess that uh, StarCraft and WarCraft kind of money sprang from that. That's where I know it from. Uh, um, um, Microsoft accepts Bitcoin for Xbox Live, Overstock.com for products. Uh, you can buy electronics on a bunch of online electronic stores. You can use uh, various gift cards and other ways to buy products on Amazon.com. You can buy plane tickets and hotels on Expedia with Bitcoin. There's a lot of... Um, uh, mainstream companies, you can buy a computer from Dell uh, sure. and pay in Bitcoin. There's many, many, many mainstream companies that accept Bitcoin, and the number increases every single, every single day. Um, so to couch but, it in some, sorry, in some real world terms, going off the well, the system. Sadly, we are saddled with for now. How much? What's the uh, price denomination? What's the value denomination of one Bitcoin? How does it work? Well, it varies from day to day. Uh, it's around two hundred dollars today. Um, so one Bitcoin is $200, but you, you got to understand that Bitcoin being a mathematical currency is actually divisible a lot smaller. So if you have a dollar, uh, you can break it down into pennies and you can a hundred pennies per dollar. That's about as far as you can go with Bitcoin. You can divide it to eight decimal places. So there's a hundred million subunits below the Bitcoin 
that you could use. Um, so based on the value, you could go, you can make payments as tiny as uh, thousands of a penny or hundreds of thousands of a penny. In fact, there are platforms that are implementing some very interesting applications using that because of that flexibility. Um, you could do, for example, streaming video where you're being billed uh, for every 200 milliseconds of, bit of uh, video that you watch and you're paying thousands of a penny for that. Wow. Uh, so you can really finely slice it into tiny, tiny, tiny units. Um, so you don't have to buy or earn or use a whole Bitcoin. You can use 0 0.0001 Bitcoin. We have various <laughs> names for the units underneath that. So a millionth of a Bitcoin is called a bit. Right. Um, a thousandth of a Bitcoin is called a millibit. Um, you can use the metric terms if you like. Uh, <laughs> decibit, centibit, millibit, etc. Uh, if you're geeky. Um, but um, you, you can express it in a number of different units. Uh, the end result is always the same. Well, actually, in the news this week, the Ashley Madison, I guess, having an affair dating site. I've just read an article saying uh, they were blackmailing people and using uh, <laughs> Bitcoin as a way of asking them for money and stuff, which is uh, quite fascinating. So, yeah, it's... Uh... Well, I mean, it's a, it's a global currency for the Internet that is instantly redeemable and uncensorable that can be transmitted uh, very quickly anywhere in the world. So, um... Could the authorities not find that said blackmailee? Because I guess every time you transact... A Bitcoin, isn't there a paper trail or a chain of custody right from There's its inception or birth? From one address to another, but you can't uh, easily associate an address with a specific individual. So you couldn't um, follow it back all through its entire history to the time it was essentially minted, if that's the correct word to use. There's no chain yes, of... You, you, you can follow its, uh, its history of yeah. providence, as it's called. But, um, you know, it's very much like, uh, can you track an IP address on the internet? You know, under some circumstances, yes. Under other circumstances, no. Sure. Um, the, the ability to use Bitcoin pseudonymously or almost near anonymously uh, is one of the strengths of the, of the currency because, because it allows uh, individuals to protect themselves against... Um, uh, censorious, uh, tyrannical, oppressive uh, governments. You know, in, in many places around the world, the ability to spend money is a life or death situation, and, and the government does not hesitate to kill, maim, torture people o over their political aff affiliation or association. You know, Ashley Madison is, is a uh, hashtag first world problem yeah. <laughs> uh, for, the most, for the most part. But imagine if instead of Ashley Madison, we're talking about the Falun Gong website in, in China or the Syrian underground, uh, uh, you know, freedom fighters or whatever it may be around the world. There's plenty of tyrannical governments where uh, anonymity is a prerequisite for political expression and representation and freedom of association. Uh, See, so it's a double-edged sword. You, ha you have to consider this from a broader perspective than simply you know, from from the privilege of a of a uh, of a country that lives under the rule of law in a developed world. Mm. No, it's uh, it's just uh, it's it just interests me that Ashley Madison that thing came. It was like, oh, Bitcoin. The, they, they're the, blackmailing the people really with their Bitcoin. The really interesting thing is the other side of Ashley Madison, <clears throat> which is the fact that in order to make financial transactions under existing credit card systems, you have to share your private information and identifiers with not only the destination website or service. Or company, but also uh, a string of dozens of intermediaries, all of which have proven repeatedly that they are absolutely not capable of protecting personal information. And the reason for that is that no one is able to collect personal information. The way you protect personal information is by not collecting it in the first place. So we have to wonder, uh, why is it that we have a payment system in the 21st century where every intermediate gets to have a full copy of our identity sure. when we could use a currency that protects our privacy? The real story of Ashley Madison and it's not people being blackmailed for Bitcoin is why the hell didn't they accept payment in Bitcoin so that you could use it anonymously mm. and, and if you think that's trivial because okay it's infidelity and maybe those people deserve to get what they got again think about it in different terms think about it as uh, being a member in a political party that's banned in a country that's totalitarian um, think about it in terms of protecting the privacy of your medical records or other things our financial system really doesn't protect privacy and identity theft is the number one problem that people deal with and bitcoin solves that problem very simply by not attaching identity to transactions suddenly identity theft is a problem of the past it's a problem of the antiquated dinosaur financial system that can't get away from using fax machines mm. so with bitcoin you are the bank essentially and it's ca uh, carried on an app on a smartphone is that correct 
uh, banking is an app. Yeah, sure. Exactly. So uh, you're not the bank. You can be if you want to. Um, uh, you can certainly be a bank, a stockbroker, an exchange. Uh, you can be all of those things just by running various apps on your computers, um, including on your smartphone. Uh, you can also have someone else act as a bank. Uh, it's probably not very smart because that takes you back to the old world where people could take your money. Sure. Um, well, if your phone got banking, stolen, perhaps. Banking has now gone from being an institution to being an app. Sure. Uh, and that's the real revolution of Bitcoin. It turns money into a programmable system. So what protects you, Andreas, if someone stole your phone? Say you're out in a club and you're a little bit drunk and you went, oh, damn, I left my phone on that table. What happened? And you, you your phone's gone, essentially. Can someone get into that phone and you're then robbed? <laughs> Well, it depends on what level of security I have. So, um, you know, you have to take certain precautions. Sure. Um, there what? are a number of really interesting technology implications with Bitcoin. One of them is a technology called multi-signature. And multi-signature is a technology that allows you to secure a certain value of Bitcoin in a system that requires more than one digital signatures to spend. You could say it requires four signatures out of a listed a number of 10 signatories. And that could mean that, for example, I have um, I could split the signing capacity between three devices, and it requires all three to sign in order to execute a transaction. So you take my phone, you've got one signature, but it actually requires two more sure. uh, from my laptop and maybe an offline device. Um, I can also store some of these keys offline. Um, I have uh, paper backups where I print the keys out on paper, keep them in a safe. Ironically, um, I've stored Bitcoin uh, paper wallets in a bank safe deposit box. Um, because uh, one thing banks are good at is uh, guards, <laughs> dogs, guns, and vaults. These are like the um, nuclear launch codes, aren't they, to you, I guess, right? Yes, it's, it's yeah. basically the same. Now, yeah. uh, by using multi-signature, you can create many structures that are really interesting. You can delegate control to others, meaning that if something happens to you, your family can use the Bitcoin by getting a signature from your estate planning attorney and, and uh, a secondary signature that's stored in, stored in a safe deposit box. Uh, you can have collaborative management of companies where it takes three executives to sign uh, a transaction protecting the monies in the company, not just from external attack, but also from internal uh, fraud, embezzlement, and things like that. It, you, programmable money gives you a lot more flexible security. Now, it also, with that power, great comes great responsibility. Sure. Um, the simple way I protect my money on my phone is is twofold. One, um, there's a pin protection, and my phone is encrypted. So um, you 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 take my phone; it's bricked. There's nothing you can do with it. Uh, if uh, if you open the Bitcoin application, it will ask you for a PIN number, and then if you don't have that, you can't do anything with it. Again, it's encrypted. Uh, but more importantly, the very simple measure I do is I only put as much money on my phone as I would put money in my wallet. Sure. I don't go around carrying my entire net worth in my leather wallet in my back pocket. Uh, nobody does. And I don't go around carrying my entire Bitcoin net worth on a phone. So just for my idiotic confusion, when you take money to put into your Bitcoin wallet to pay for things on a daily basis, where's the source? Is it stored? Is it in a cloud? Is it in a, a computer, well, no, a laptop? it's not in the cloud because that would mean trusting other people with my Bitcoin and, and I don't do that. Uh, I have tiers, if you like. Uh, so there is like deep cold storage, which is, which is money that's for long-term savings uh, and investments that I touch very, very rarely, maybe two or three times a year. Sure. Uh, that's usually stored on uh, multiple paper, encrypted backups in multiple locations, offline sure, not okay. on computers and that's uh, as hack proof as it gets it still requires a password that i've memorized um so i that... also have some hardware devices uh these devices are little bitcoin wallets that plug into usb and require uh, a pin number to activate and i i keep those in my safe um and that's for intermediate amounts so what i would normally keep in a checking account for example uh, and then I transfer small amounts every week or so if I need to onto my uh, wallet, and I use that for day-to-day -day transactions. Okay, so let's get crazy here, Andreas. Let's say the CIA want to besmirch your name and ruin you financially. If they get hold of your phone, hack into the app, they get into your safe, and they get a few of your, uh, I guess, paper-written down uh, <laughs> uh, Bitcoin codes in the bank, is that a way of getting to you, or can they not get through all of the... Essentially, like the bulkheads in a ship on a submarine, they would lock off if it was going to sink, or a ship. Right. Could so they get through the bulkheads and sink um, your ship? 
has a, in the security industry, we use a concept called defense in depth, which means that you apply layers. Sure. So, um, you know, taking your money offline is one layer, then having it printed on physical media disconnected from the internet is the second layer. Uh, then that is encrypted with a password that I remember in my head. Um, that's a third layer. It might have multi-signatures uh, split among multiple people. That's a fourth layer. Sure. Uh, my phone itself is encrypted, pin protected. Uh, it's connected by proximity to my watch. So if you take it away from me, uh, once you go beyond 30 or 40 feet, it's going to lock the phone. Don't tell them uh, the secrets, Andreas. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, I'm a security professional. I'm not saying this is sure. what everybody's going to <laughs> I'm do. Just in fact, one of the things about Bitcoin is that because it's very early in, in its maturity, just like the internet was in the 1990s, yes. it's actually not that easy to use for lay people. In fact, a lot of um, lay people who would use Bitcoin today could end up uh, losing their money because they don't know how to secure it. So that's where there's an opportunity in the industry to design security devices that are easier to use. Sure. Um, there's a couple of really nice hardware wallets that we've seen come out, which are little devices that have maybe a SIM card in them or they connect via USB. They're hardware protected and tamper proof. They've got a pin number or fingerprint scanner on them. And they're designed to really make it foolproof to secure uh, Bitcoin as an individual. But, you know, you've got to understand who are we protecting against? You know, I'm protecting my money from hackers and things like that if the cia wanted to mess with my life they could do that quite easily sure um and nothing i do is going to <laughs> stop them from doing that other than hopefully they have more important things to do like protect national security rather than messing with a geek um who's <laughs> playing with experimental uh, money and and if we do reach the point where that's what they have to do then again you have to question what kind of society do we live in sure well, before we wrap up, I know you're very busy. I'm going to let you go in a minute. I just want to hit three little points. One, uh, where do you see Bitcoin if it continues like this in 100 years? What will the world be like? Will there be no more government Will there be as we have it now? Will there be no more banks as we have them now? Will it be a utopian H.G. Wells-esque society? I, I think going 100 years is uh, pretty far-fetched, I think. Um, but I think that uh, Bitcoin... Here, I, I want to make a, a distinction because Bitcoin, the currency itself, is you know the first implementation of this, and I think it's doing very, very well. It's extremely robust after uh, six, almost seven years of existence. It's, it's growing and succeeding in a, in a way that no one could have anticipated. I certainly didn't, even I didn't uh, expect in my wildest dreams that Bitcoin would be um, maturing as a technology as fast as it's maturing and, and developing so much incredible innovation and applications. Sure. But if we go out 10 years, the idea of decentralized money as implemented by the technology behind Bitcoin, whether we call it Bitcoin, whether it's some other system that uses exactly the same technology, the technology is not going away. We have invented a way of making protocol network centric money. Uh, that is not going away. And so my conclusion is really simple. Uh, protocol and network centric money is vastly superior to traditional payment systems on every possible way you could measure it in terms of security, uh, distribution of power, incorruptibility, in terms of economic inclusion and opportunity for the developing world. Um, anytime you take something that used to be an institution and you turn it into a platform and then you turn it into a protocol, it improves. We did that with telecommunications. It's happening rapidly across the world. We now live um, essentially in the century of network-based societal organization. Sure. Uh, whether it's about news or entertainment or communication, we're replacing centralized hierarchical institutions with broad network-based participatory organizations. Uh, and, and Bitcoin is the money version of that. And I have no doubt that um, participatory communication, participatory news, participatory and, and uh, uh, global politics, um, all of these things are both bringing the world together and freeing people and empowering people in an unprecedented way. And they're going to have deep and resounding impact in all global societies over the next couple of decades. Uh, and of course, money is going to be one of them. So banking as it exists today is as dead as newspapers uh, were in 1990. They just don't know it yet. Sure. Um, they will. That doesn't mean they're going to go away. Uh, that means they're going to adapt and change their function dramatically. Um, and so 
for, for many of the organizations out there that are in traditional financial industries, they're facing the same crisis that the news industry or the communication industry or the entertainment industry faced with the introduction of the internet, which is reinvent yourself or fall by the wayside as an anachronism. And, you know, I'm quite confident that uh, many of these financial institutions will be very successful in that. Sure. And, and, of course, many will not be. Then there's going to be a ripple effect, which is what happens when you create global systems of commerce that uh, do not care about borders, uh, that empower individuals, that give the freedom of transaction and economic inclusion to billions of people around the world. How does that affect tyrannical governments? How does that affect... Um, corrupt banking systems, and I, and I think that's really interesting. I think it can it can bring a a level of uh, productivity and prosperity and and freedom to many places in the world where such things do not exist today. And it's probably going to dramatically change the way we go shopping in the Western world. Although I I don't think that's really as interesting uh, as the possibility of a a, a farmer in Kenya using uh, a Nokia one thousand text messaging phone to be able to originate loans from, from thousands of creditors in the developing world, uh, to be able to trade internationally and run an import-export business off a text phone. Uh, and that is possible sure. today. And um, We'll get and money sent to him via relative, I guess. accelerating through Bitcoin. Yeah. Well, I was going to say we'll get money sent to him via relatives around the world. Is that correct? And, uh, yeah, well, remittances is probably one of the hottest and most likely areas where Bitcoin is going to gain foothold before uh, any other areas, primarily because you have enormous financial flows that are fraught with delays and high fees and difficulties. And what's the charge gains. for it? What's the uh, transfer charge for Bitcoin versus a bank? Or is it vary with a bank, I suppose, right? So the numbers are really interesting. $550 billion are transmitted internationally for remittances from migrant workers to their home countries. Uh, most of those are sent to women who control household budgets in the developing world. Um, the companies involved charge fees of $175 billion on those flows. Um, so, uh, you know, almost 20% um, in profits go directly to these companies. The average fee, um, I think worldwide is about 9%, but volume weighted, it's, it's higher in the poorest countries in the world. A Bitcoin transaction today costs about um, 15 to 20 cents right. um, <clears throat> to send, US dollar cents. Um, and that is if you want to send $1,000, if you want to send $100 or if you want to send $100 billion, you will pay $0.15. Cents. Um, and five seconds later, it will be in the ownership of your destination. Uh, wow. An hour later, it will be cleared by the network with full settlement of those funds uh, anywhere in the world. And there's absolutely no payment system that can do that today. So for remittances, um, this is a, a very rich uh, possibility. Now, keep sure. in mind, most of the people who use remittances this way won't even know they're using Bitcoin. Um, they will transmit dollars on one end, uh, receive, say, pesos in Mexico, and Bitcoin will be used in between to connect the two nodes, uh, but uh, it, it won't be visible. So essentially, it just becomes, um, just like most people who use the internet don't know what TCP IP is, don't care. Uh, they just click on Facebook. Yeah. And and so that's really why Bitcoin as a protocol of money um, becomes more interesting the less we talk about it. it is it affected by inflation, Andreas? Is it like if you bought a, a loaf of bread now on Bitcoin, would it be the same price 10 years from now on Bitcoin? So um, actually, Bitcoin is a deflationary asset, meaning that... Um, its monetary policy is designed to replicate that of precious metals. There is a fixed total supply of 21 million Bitcoin. Uh, that is the total supply of Bitcoin that will ever be created, and that's guaranteed by the mathematical algorithm and, and cannot be changed unless everyone in the network uh, agrees to change it, which is extremely, extremely unlikely. Sure. Um, what that means is that uh, you can't just keep printing money and uh, inflating the currency uh, into worthlessness, which is a, a really interesting property right now because what's happening in international currency markets is this um, currency war of who can hit the bottom first. All of these uh, governments that are massively indebted, their only way out of the debt is to make the currency worthless so the debt is worth nothing. 
uh, which is uh, fine if you're an indebted government, not so good if you're a retiree who's been saving all their life and suddenly all of your savings get turned into worthless uh, money. <laughs> like so, an Enron you know, scandal. You have this um, real challenge of incentives and <laughs> motivations uh, that differ between savers and governments, indebted governments. Um, Bitcoin preserves wealth over long periods of time by effectively having a fixed supply that cannot grow. Um, how that plays out, we don't know. We've never seen anything like this. The combination of something that behaves like precious metals but can be emailed in a few seconds from Los Angeles to Kuala Lumpur with nobody being able to censor it, um, we don't know how that behaves. All I know is it's probably something really useful. Sure. Yeah. Well, in uh, in fi well in in well as we wrap up now, what can the layperson uh, do? How do they get their foot on the Bitcoin ladder? Where do they begin? How does someone get a Bitcoin wallet? How do they get a Bitcoin to start their, I guess, Bitcoin life and try and change the world? Because it's an utterly fascinating thing that I really do think will just well rock the foundations of. Uh, what's been built so far but in a good it's, way it's a bit like trying to get onto the internet in the, in the early 90s and uh you know it's not that easy um you can go on um any of the app stores on android or iphone uh on mac on windows and you can search for bitcoin wallet um just like searching for web browser you're going to find a lot of choices and they're all compatible with each other and offer different capabilities and features and are catering for different audiences sure. you know picking your bitcoin wallet is a bit like picking between mozilla firefox chrome internet explorer and don't pick internet explorer um <laughs> and and safari uh, and some of them are better than others uh you can go and search for bitcoin wallets and you can find one on android how do you get bitcoin itself my advice has always been the same which is instead play of dungeons and bitcoin, dragons <laughs> earn it earn it okay so um, People have products, services, skills. Um, you know, if you're a hairdresser, you can cut hair, cut hair for Bitcoin. If you're a taxi driver, give people rides for Bitcoin. If you make pizza, sell pizza for Bitcoin. If you cater parties, sell your food for Bitcoin. If you mow lawns, mow lawns for Bitcoin. If you're a travel agent, try selling travel for Bitcoin. Um, there are many ways to do that. If you're doing it as a business, you can receive Bitcoin and convert it instantaneously to your national currency so as you're not exposed to currency valuation changes um, and make it uh, essentially a payment mechanism just like you take Visa, MasterCard, Bitcoin. Um, relatively easy to implement. If you're an individual, you can take payments directly onto your cell phone uh, with no intermediaries, no setting up bank accounts, no identifying yourself. Just simply download the wallet, run it on your phone, you have a Bitcoin wallet. And then you can start offering to uh, products or services. Actually, one of the one of my friends in the Bitcoin space uh, made a lot of Bitcoin in the early days uh, by baking baklava, um, and so they called it baking for Bitcoin. And they um, they sold baklava and bacon weaves um, at uh, at uh, various events and conferences. And, uh, and they made a lot of Bitcoin uh, just based on that, just by opening their oven and baking pastries. Wow, my God. So I can't uh, take some cash, go to somewhere and go, can I swap £100 cash for Bitcoin? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. you can trade. I mean, it just okay. gets a bit more complicated. So there's a website called localbitcoins.com, which is kind of like a Craigslist where sure. you can um, put an ad up and say, uh, or you can look and find someone who sells Bitcoin in your area. Uh, who has good reviews and seems reliable, meet them in a public place. Uh, be smart about not carrying a lot of cash into a meeting with some stranger, just like you wouldn't do that on Craigslist because you're going to get jumped. Sure. Um, mm. You know, be smart, do it in a public place, uh, and you give them the cash and they transfer the Bitcoin to your phone and there's a text-based uh, escrow service so they can't just run away with the cash. Okay. Um, and... <laughs> I may call and you for more advice. A, a good one. There's also Bitcoin ATMs. Most cities, um, most major cities in the developed world have a Bitcoin ATM somewhere. So you could, you know, where you live, you could say, you know, Bitcoin ATM in London and you can go find uh, a Bitcoin ATM. You can stuff a couple of 20 pound bills in it and out uh, comes some Bitcoin straight to your phone. Um, you can use an exchange where you would need to set up an account, kind of like a brokerage account, and you can trade, mm. buy and sell Bitcoin online. Um, and that you can be transmitted directly to your bank account. Uh, most countries have exchanges in operation where you can do that. Um, you can also use various applications to find other people in the area who want to buy and sell Bitcoin in small amounts, uh, meet them up again and, and trade cash. So there's lots of opportunities. 
but probably, you know, the best one is rather than treating this as a speculative investment or a strange currency. Well, use um, it. Earn it. Yeah. Uh, rather than trying to buy it. And I think that's the best advice mm-hmm. I can give. Just to, just to experience the technology, develop some skills in it. You know, get to be one of those people who who sees the future today before everybody else does. No, absolutely. It's cool stuff. Yeah, no, it is. It's. I just feel like I've just hit like the 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 tip of the iceberg. Even speaking to you, of course, uh, it's uh, there's so much to learn and and to do with this, especially for a layperson like myself. But I do find it utterly fascinating, and I know it's going to change the world. And if it's not this, it'll be one of the I guess Bitcoin or other competitors. There's there's a various other like there's a few more out there, isn't there? There's, there's tons of. Uh, Electronic there's almost currencies. a thousand alternative coins that are competing wow. in some way. Obviously, uh, there's an enormous advantage to the early adopter and the, mm. the network effect, as it's called. Um, I think I think it would be extremely surprising if, if Bitcoin did not continue to exist uh, and be very robust and resilient for many, many more years. Sure. Uh, so I'm quite mm. confident that Bitcoin is going to be a, uh, around for a very long time. Um, in, in fact, there's no reason to, to believe that it's going away um, or that its value could uh, could crash to, to zero because even for sentimental reasons, uh, many people who have Bitcoin will continue to hold it. Sure. And as long as there's two computers running Bitcoin, Bitcoin exists. It's a, it's a very pesky <laughs> thing that you can't get rid of so easily. It's a relentless anomaly. Uh, yeah. and, um, and in a network-connected world, uh, relentless anomalies propagate. If you have something that can actually solve problems for people, that can empower people economically, um, it's very difficult to put a stop to that. Is your hope this will be the world currency in a few years' time? No, my hope is that the concept of a world currency or a national currency becomes a complete anachronism, just like the idea of a national airline or a national phone company is like a relic from the 70s. Effectively, national banking and national currencies are also relics from the 70s. We just haven't noticed yet. Sure. Um, I imagine a, a future in which uh, people can transact in as many currencies as they want, and by having an electronic wallet, it's pretty much seamless. Uh, they don't even notice which transa- currency they're transacting in. Their, their wallet handles all of those details. Yeah. Um, and uh, they can they can simply use electronic money that is personal and untraceable and uncensorable on a global basis outside the hold of governments, outside the hold of banks, uh, money of the people, for the people, and by the people. What a great way to wrap up. Andreas, I can't thank you enough for coming on this show. You're one of my uh, guest wish list people. And I never thought you'd actually respond to my tweet. So uh, thank you so much. I do hope we can do this again. Uh, yeah, because... thank you for hosting me. I, I'd be delighted to do this again. Yeah, no, I've had a great time. Uh, I'm sure I'll come away with this with more questions uh, for next time to bury you with. But in the meantime, uh, I can't thank you enough, sir. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, it's right. been great. I loved every minute of it. And uh, stay in touch. Absolutely. Andreas, um, thank you. Bye I bye. love you, you beautiful man. Thank you. <laughs> to the next episode. So Just do you actually here. not have any Bitcoin at the moment? I don't know. Okay, well, we can fix that pretty quickly. Okay. Um, <laughs> you know, there's, there's, there's showing, there's telling, and then there's experiencing. So let's fix that. You have a phone. I got a phone. You got a phone. <laughs> okay. It's an Android phone? It's an Android phone. You have a Bitcoin wallet on it? I don't. Should we go okay, to the so, App Store? Hang on. So, so go to the App Store and download this thing. Just waiting for the message to come through. Open. Okay, we're in. You can uh, creating new. So if you can see that. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, we're in. Awesome. So you, what are you looking at? Very good. So that's your wallet. Yeah. Um, and what you're seeing there is the system generates a new Bitcoin address for you over every transaction. And they're all controlled by keys here. Um, once we're done with this. Okay. Uh, you want to click on the little menu and go to backup. Okay. And that will allow you to write down a phrase uh, with English words that becomes your wallet backup. That means if you lose your phone, then you can use that phrase to restore all of your transactions and funds. Um, You can also use the settings page to set a pin. We won't do that now. You can do it when you're ready. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, what I want you to do is... Tap on that little barcode to make it bigger. Yeah. And then you show it to me. Um, that's basically it. Sorry. Oh, man. <laughs> okay, and just hold it still for a second. 
Very good. Okay. Done. So now I have your Bitcoin address, which is 1LDTHJTBOBML, whatever. Yep. Um, now, that's like a public email address. If I have that address, I can send you Bitcoin, but I can't do anything else. Sure. I can't take Bitcoin from you. Right, so you can show that to anyone. In fact, someone put that on an ESPN jumbotron and raised his college fund in about ten minutes um, during a game. Printed wow. a giant foam-backed poster and showed it to the world. I've seen people walk around with T-shirts. One of the artists I I like uh, has a the, the barcode printed on their guitar, um, <laughs> so that you can donate to them directly. Now that I have this, uh, I'm going to do send. So um, I could theoretically put this on the uh, website for donations and things, correct? Absolutely. I already I have one on my website. You can put that exact barcode on your website and the address below, and people can make Bitcoin donations to you. So just screen grab it, cut it out, and stick it on something, right? Right. Yeah. Exactly. Wow. That's um, amazing, Andreas. Yeah. So now uh, I'm going to tell it to send you two US dollars. Okay. Um, you can select which currency you want to operate in. If I say two US dollars, it converts that, and it says that a current price that is nine point two nine eight milli Bitcoin, so thousands of a Bitcoin. Okay. Right. And then I hit OK. Right. And send. It asks me for my PIN, which is how I protect my phone from someone stealing my money, and it's sent. Now, if you go back to your original page. Okay. Uh, there's a little refresh icon, but oh, receiving. Okay. Amazing, Andreas. That's <laughs> the future of money. So I didn't need to trust you. You didn't need to trust me. We're not trusting a third party, and this money went directly from the Bitcoin network through my control to the Bitcoin network through your control in just a matter of seconds. And now you have two US dollars. As wow. you may have noticed, also. The fee was so I paid the fee. Sure. Um, the fee itself was uh, one penny. Right. Oh wow. Okay. So you actually got it for free. Sure. You got the full two dollars. Now you can send it elsewhere. You can send it to me. You can send it to someone else. Let's try the opposite. Well, how so, do I send it back? Yeah. How do I do it? Oh, don't send all of it back. Okay. Just send me. 20 cents so you can see how it works. So click on send. Okay. And then click on the camera icon or scan QR code. Okay. All right. And then I will hold it up to the screen. Hold the camera up so that you can see my there we go. barcode. Okay, done it. Okay. You've got it. So Says recipient address. address. Yeah. yeah it, it checks sums it to make sure it's correct. Now, what you want to do is um, enter amounts, right? So under enter amount, yeah, click on enter amount. Then at the top where it says amount, if you tap on the right where it says MBTC or BTC, yeah, and you flip that to USD, yeah, I send one dollar, two dollars to you. No, no, no. Send send ten cents. Okay. I want, you, I want to show you how small you can get. Point ten cents. 0 0.10 USD. Yep. Okay, and, and then hit OK. Yeah. And then hit send. OK. Sending. Oh, receiving. Wow. What really happened? <laughs> that wasn't even a second. And you're yeah. in you're in San Fran, right? It doesn't matter where I am. I could have been in Kuala Lumpur. Wow, that's amazing. It, it takes it's the speed of the internet. It's about as fast as sending an email. Yeah. No, I, I'm utterly in shock. It's incredible. Before. We didn't have to set a, set up a bank accounts or anything like that. It took you about thirty seconds to be up and running with Bitcoin and start sending or receiving funds. This is the future of money. Sure. Okay. Well, I got to get on my next call. Thank you so much for your time. No, thank and, you, Andreas. Uh, Andreas, could I include this portion of the show uh, as part of the show, or no? Do you advise against that? Do you just wrap up when we did, or can I include this kind of transaction on camera? It? It's still recording now, but I can obviously edit the end of this off because it's not live and just say goodbye when we said goodbye. Yeah, absolutely you can include it. Yeah, you can write about it. Okay. Nothing secret got exchanged. That's the beauty of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just, I just wanted to make sure. Because, yeah, I think yeah. That, that little transaction will help people understand it. It certainly has me. It's just uh, it's done the world of good. So, yeah. yeah. Dude, right. thank you so much. We'll do this again soon. I love you. Andreas, you got it. thank you. Take care, Bye. Bye-bye. Take care.